Can you hear me? Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Dr. Hugh Ross's Paradox class. It's great to be live again and in person and see people's faces, and it's really excellent. Um, I like to say that Zoom is better than nothing, but only barely, because it's really good to see people. Um, I just want to make sure everybody that's here live, please turn your cell phones off because it's really distracting when they ring and somebody's up here. So please check it. That would help us. Uh, bathrooms are around the corner. This door, follow the signs, and you'll find them. Easy to find. Uh, I want to remind everybody that tomorrow is Memorial Day. If you have the opportunity to honor people who served, Please do that. Please take the day off if you can. And if you can't, slow down, say a prayer, thank the Lord that we live in this country where we can honor people on Memorial Day. Um, Dr. Ross is going to be with us uh, in a minute, and he's going to be with us in class here until the 12th when he's off. We don't have a, another speaker yet, but we'll let you know as soon as we do. So. Let's get Dr. Ross up here as soon as possible, but I want to say a prayer first. Heavenly Father, we're so grateful. We thank you for the opportunity that we live in this country where we can still worship you and honor you and find ways to show off your great deeds, the way you invented the earth, the way you invented the universe, Lord. We just thank you for all the little signs, the big signs, all the things every day that, that just remind us that you are real, that you are good, and, and that you love us. You're such an extravagant God, Lord, even in times that are hard. We have to remember that you are an extravagant, generous God. We thank you, Lord. We thank you always for Dr. Hugh Ross, who has been so faithful and loyal to this class and bringing us um, your word and how to honor you and worship you for so many years, Lord. We thank you so much. Bless Dr. Ross as he addresses us this afternoon. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Dr. Hugh Ross. Okay, well, thank you and welcome. Really appreciate being able to address people in person again, especially since only have to use one computer when we're doing this in person. So uh, that's a big relief. Uh, but we are joined by a significant virtual audience, literally from all over the world. And so when we get to the Q&A time, we'll be taking questions both from people that are here live and people that are also uh, joining us uh, virtually. And our biggest audience of all are those people that download the recordings of this class uh, from paradoxes.org and uh, you know, and other websites as well that uh, partner with us and uh, making available this content. And I was just talking to people, they said, well, what's the minimum number of downloads you get per class? Uh, the bottom number is 1,300. And you say, what's the top number? The top number is 55,000. So uh, this is a large class, even though there's not a lot of you uh, here uh, in person. Uh, but now that we're meeting in person, we've moved to a new format where we're not gonna be doing long series like we've been doing, we're gonna do short series. And so this is the part four of a four part series addressing the question, are we alone? And uh, next week I'll be launching a new series that'll probably be a three part series. And uh, this is asking the question, uh, are we human beings alone in the universe as the only physical species uh, that's intelligent and capable of launching a global uh, civilization. And so we spent one session, uh, the very first session, looking at what does the Bible say about this question? And basically we noted that the Bible puts few restraints other than the fact that if life exists elsewhere in the universe, it's by the handiwork of God. Uh, naturalistic process will not be adequate to explain extraterrestrial life. But then we really addressed the question what limits does the Bible put on beings like us that are physical and spiritual and particularly beings that are in need of redemption uh, from their sin and evil 
and the Bible does put some limited constraints on that. If you're interested, you can uh, download the recording. And uh, the last couple of times we've been here, we've been looking at what does the book of nature say. And this is the core feature of reasons to believe, that God reveals himself reliably in an utterly trustworthy manner through two books of Revelation, the book of scripture and the book of nature. And so we're going to wrap up today, what does the book of nature say about this uh, question? And uh, basically we're looking at uh, tests for exohabitability. Uh, what is the possibility as we look elsewhere in the universe? Are we actually finding galaxy clusters, super galaxy clusters, stars, planetary systems that could be conceivable candidates to host uh, not just microbes, uh, but advanced life? And I've got a book coming out next month uh, that uh, gets into this in some detail. The book is titled Design to the Core. Uh, it may be released as late as July, but we're hoping it'll be available sometime in June. And if you can't wait for the book to come out, you'll find significant content in this book, The Creator and the Cosmos, the fourth edition. And anyone can get a free chapter of that book simply by going to reasons.org slash Ross. But actually, as I've been developing this four-part series, there's been new discoveries published in the recent scientific literature that allow us to dig deeper into this subject matter than we would have thought even two weeks ago. And what's happened in the uh, past uh, week is that uh, there's been 10 papers published in the Astrophysical Journal Letters. The May 10th issue of the Astrophysical Journal Letters, 10 papers have been published uh, by the Event Horizon Telescope Collaboration. And I spoke about that two weeks ago, how astronomers have networked uh, these millimeter wave radio telescopes all over the world uh, in an effort to construct a telescope with a resolving power of almost the diameter of the Earth. And uh, how this Event Horizon Telescope uh, has 4,000 times the resolving power that you get with a James Webb Space Telescope. And I'm not dissing the James Webb Space Telescope. It's by far uh, the most precise uh, space telescope or ground-based telescope that's been orbited, uh, but it doesn't compete with a telescope that's almost the diameter uh, of the Earth. And I showed this image to you two weeks ago. They use this Event Horizon Telescope with this very high resolving power uh, to image the event horizon of a supermassive black hole in the center of our galaxy. Now this is a preliminary image. The team is continuing to do observations and they've been actually working with this network of radio telescopes around the world for four years. It took them four years to accumulate enough data to get this image. And as you see, it's a bit fuzzy and uh, you know, they don't really have a significant definition, but they were able to see the black part of the black hole. And the principle is this, black holes uh, suck matter in towards it. And as that matter comes towards the black hole, uh, just outside what's called the event horizon, matter gets converted into pure energy with 10 to 40% efficiency. So these are the brightest objects in the universe. I mean, to give you a point of comparison, the nuclear furnace in the interior of our star, the sun, converts matter into energy with 0.07% efficiency. Here we're talking 10 to 40%. And, uh, but once you get to the event horizon, the gravity is so strong that nothing can escape, not even light. And so the prediction from general relativity, there'll be a certain distance out from the center of the black hole that depends on the black hole's mass where everything will be black because uh, nothing will be able to escape but not even light itself. But just beyond the event horizon, uh, you actually have uh, general relativity converting matter to energy with 10 to 40% efficiency. But the fact that it took four years for the event horizon telescope collaboration uh, to get this rather fuzzy image tells us that the black hole at the center of our galaxy is not pulling in that much matter. And 
these 10 papers that get just got, and by the way, these papers are open access, which means all of you can read those papers free of charge. Uh, there's no uh, pay barrier. Uh, they made them all available open access. I've read the 10 papers. I can tell you that most of the people here in this room, you can read and understand the content because they really wrote the paper in such a way that non-experts can actually understand uh, the points that are being made in the paper. Just skip over the equations and just read the words and uh, you'll be fine. And there's not that many equations in the 10 papers. But what I wanted to do is take a few minutes in this talk to reveal to you uh, some of the amazing discoveries that showed up in these uh, 10 uh, papers. And so you'll find them in the Astrophysical Journal, May 10th edition. Uh, and what they discovered is that the reason why it was so challenging for them to get this initial image is that unlike the supermassive black hole in the center of the giant galaxy M87 at the center of the Virgo cluster, they published that image uh, back in 2019. Uh, this particular black hole is pulling in so little matter uh, that you really don't get a very bright image around the black hole. So the donut is quite dim. And they were able to determine that the supermassive black hole in the Milky Way's core uh, is consuming the mass equivalent of one-fifth of the moon per year. Now that's a remarkably tiny mass because it was typical, and by the way, every large galaxy has a supermassive black hole. I can tell you that the black hole in the center of our galaxy is under massive by a factor of at least 30 times. The Andromeda galaxy, another large spiral galaxy that has the same mass as our Milky Way galaxy, it's got a typical supermassive black hole. It comes in at 140 million times the mass of our star, the Sun. The supermassive black hole in our galaxy is the least massive of any large galaxy that we know. It weighs only four million times the mass of our star, the Sun. Sounds like a lot, but you're not gonna find any other large galaxy that's got such a remarkably tiny supermassive black hole. But not only is it tiny, relatively tiny, at least currently, it's drawing in very little matter, which explains why this image was so difficult for the astronomers to detect. Uh, just one-fifth of the moon's mass uh, per year. And then they spent four years measuring the light variations in that donut around the uh, event horizon. And what they discovered was that they're getting variations in the light output outside the event horizon that measures between one minute and one hour. Now that's atypical because with other supermassive black holes and other galaxies, Typically, every month you get a bright flash coming out. Why? Because it's pulling in a planet or a star or even a star cluster. And when you pull in objects with that huge amount of mass, or what's also typical is they pull in these giant molecular clouds. And these are massive bodies. So when they get sucked into the supermassive black hole, you get this tremendously bright emission. That's not happening with our Milky Way's supermassive black hole. It's not pulling in anything big. And moreover, when they've measured over the past four years, they're basically saying it's sucking in tiny pieces of matter at a rate of about one per minute or once per hour, but almost all of them are coming in on a time scale of about once every 10 minutes. So rarely you get one every minute or every hour, more typical, that they're coming in at about every 10 minutes. Now, this wasn't in the research uh, paper. Well, well, this was that the degree of variation is 5%. In other words, uh, when they look at this donut that's around the supermassive black hole, the light variation is only about 5% over the course of the past four years. What does that mean? It means it's pulling in bits and pieces of matter at a very steady, continual rate. So rather than getting these gigantic bursts where it pulls in a star uh, or a big planet uh, or a large moon, 
it's pulling in tiny pieces at a very regular level. And so you're getting this steady light that only varies by plus or minus uh, 5%. And again, this isn't in the papers, but this is a conclusion I drew from reading the papers, that the supermassive black hole in the center of our galaxy consumes a comet or an asteroid about the mass of Phobos about once every 10 minutes. So think of that tiny moon that orbits Mars, Phobos. It's the largest of the moons that's orbiting Mars. If you want to see an image of Phobos, this is what it looks like. And uh, it's 22 and a half kilometers across, or 14 miles if you like imperial measurements, uh, 14 miles. And so this is what we consider to be a relatively small uh, comet or asteroid. And previous studies have shown that surrounding the supermassive black hole in the center of our galaxy is a giant cloud of comets and asteroids. And evidently, our supermassive black hole is consuming uh, one of these comets or asteroids, typically at a rate of once every 10 minutes. But this explains why you can be here in the paradoxes class today. If our supermassive black hole were like the supermassive black holes in other large spiral galaxies, they'd be pulling in bigger objects, not as frequently as once every 10 minutes, maybe once a week, once a month. But when they pull in big objects, you get a deadly burst of radiation coming out from just beyond the event horizon. And that deadly burst wouldn't be a problem of all of us in this room were microbes. But the fact that we're human beings, human beings are much more subject to the radiation coming out from supermassive black holes than microbes would be. Uh, or for example, mice. Uh, you know, mice uh, get damaged, but they don't live long anyways. And so typically what this radiation does, it brings up the cancer risk, it begins to destroy your organs. And so it might not kill us, but it might prevent us from being able to be functional uh, for several decades, which would have a major impact on uh, civilization uh, here on the planet Earth. And one of the papers actually calculated uh, just what is the radiation level uh, in this donut uh, outside the supermassive black hole, and basically shows that it's eight uh, times 10 to the 35 ergs uh, per second, and uh, that would be uh, the total uh, radiation at all wavelengths uh, coming out uh, from there. And you can compare that with the sun's uh, total luminosity. And the bottom line is this gigantic supermassive black hole, the radiation that it's emitting as a result of its sucking matter in towards its event horizon is only about 200 times greater uh, than the radiation coming out of the sun. And because of that extremely low level, all of us are basically safe. Uh, you don't have to worry about that supermassive black hole. You don't have to worry now. We would have had to worry if we were here a couple of million years ago because what astronomers have seen is they've detected a giant X-ray, gamma ray, couple of bubbles uh, right at the center of our galaxy. And we now recognize that those bubbles were formed by our supermassive black hole, which what tells us is that approximately two million years ago, the supermassive black hole in the center of our galaxy pulled in something that was quite massive, probably a star uh, or a giant molecular cloud. And therefore, that resulted in a huge burst of energy that today we can still see as expanding bubbles of X-ray and a gamma rays. But right now, that's not happening. And so, but we now realize what we see here in this image uh, would have been fairly typical throughout the history of our Milky Way galaxy. Bottom line, we happen to be living in our Milky Way galaxy when the supermassive black hole in the center of our galaxy is pulling in very little matter and what matter it pulls in, it pulls in at a tiny, steady rate. Or to put it another way, the supermassive black hole in the center of our galaxy is gradually sipping. It's not gulping matter. And because it's gradually sipping tiny pieces of matter, we are safe here on planet Earth. 
we humans can thrive and launch global high technology civilization and use that civilization to be able to take the good news of salvation through Jesus Christ to all the people groups of the world. If God put us here two million years ago, that would not have been possible uh, because our supermassive black hole just wouldn't have allowed that to happen. Uh, or if we were in a galaxy like the Andromeda galaxy, where the supermassive black hole is 35 times more massive, which means it's bound to be drawing in a lot more. But that's something else that astronomers have detected, is that yes, things are a lot more deadly in the Andromeda galaxy than in our galaxy, but just like the supermassive black hole in our Milky Way galaxy, currently is in a very quiet stage, astronomers likewise have discovered that the supermassive black hole in the center of the Andromeda galaxy, it is noisier than our supermassive black hole, but it's quiet enough, and it's been quiet for the last several thousand years, uh, so that the radiation coming off of the Andromeda galaxy poses no threat to human life here. Now, with a mass of 140 million times the mass of our star, the sun, if it was pulling in stars and giant molecular clouds, even though it's two and a half million light years away, that's close enough that it would have been posing a problem. Again, not a problem for microbes, not a problem for mice that don't live very long, uh, not a problem for turtles who live a long time but don't, don't do much, but it would be a problem for creatures like us uh, that are highly active with complex uh, proteins and long uh, lifespans. Now, if you want to read more about this, I actually got a paper published in a peer-reviewed journal on black holes, and uh, it's called Black Holes as Evidence of God's Care. What's fun about that journal article is that I drew three uh, astrophysicists reviewers uh, who were, well, one of them might have been a theist, but the other two were certainly atheists, and uh, so they really tried to uh, reject my paper, but you can actually read the exchanges between me and the reviewers. And uh, so that's kind of fun, actually seeing a public uh, exchange between a Christian astrophysicist and those that are not. And finally, they did say, okay, we're going to let the paper get published. And I just checked this past week. In that particular journal, it's in the March 2021 journal, and uh, of all the papers published in that particular issue, uh, my article's got the highest number of reads by quite a wide margin. So, and they've actually asked me if I could uh, be an editor for a special issue of a future journal, not in that particular journal, but another one of their journals. So I'll be taking that on. It just got approved uh, day before yesterday. So hopefully that's going to open up a door for a lot of the scholars in our scholar community uh, to publish in the, in the secular uh, peer-reviewed uh, literature. Well, let me move on. Uh, this is basically making the point that this seems to suggest that we indeed are alone because we live in the only super galaxy cluster in the entire universe that has the right features to make advanced life possible. We talked about that last week. We live in the only galaxy cluster where that's possible. We live in the only galaxy group where that's possible. And this is basically making the point we're living in the only galaxy. I covered that last week. We're also living at the only epoch in the history of our galaxy where advanced life is possible. And so earlier or later, we'd be in trouble right now. Uh, we're good to go. So this is a significant evidence indicating that in all likelihood, we are alone because earlier in the history of our galaxy, uh, advanced life like us would not be possible and it's unlikely to be possible in the future. Now, the book I got coming out designed to the core, I also make the point that we live in the only part of the spiral arm structure of our Milky Way galaxy where advanced life is possible. I got a whole chapter on that, and I'm not going into the details, because I promised you I would actually finish this series today. So I'm omitting that, uh, but you can check that out when Design to the Core comes out. Uh, but we're also living in a unique bubble in our Milky Way galaxy. We live in what's called the local bubble. So this is the local bubble. And uh, the nice thing about being in this particular bubble is that it's an under-dense part 
of our Milky Way galaxy. And so it's a part of our galaxy uh, where deadly radiation uh, from nearby um, nebulae and stars is minimal. And then inside this local bubble, uh, we live in what's called the local fluff. And uh, we also, I won't go into the details of that, that's covered in detail and designed to the core, because you kind of get the idea. We live in a unique galaxy. We live in a unique part of that galaxy where we got the just right spiral arm structure. And inside that spiral arm structure, we live within a unique bubble. There's lots of bubbles in our region, but we live in the one bubble uh, where advanced civilization is possible. And we also live inside that local bubble in this unique local fluff uh, where advanced life is possible. And then jumping to our star. As we look at our star, the sun, and uh, there's literally dozens of papers that have been published on this over the years, uh, but the bottom line is our sun is a star like no other star. Uh, it's deficient in lithium and it's deficient in refractory elements. Refractory elements refer to elements that uh, are not liquid in their normative state or they're not vaporous, they're not gaseous, they're solid. And so this would refer to basically the metals that we see in the periodic table. And the sun, uh, for stars of its age and its size, is deficient uh, in those refractory elements and especially deficient in the lithium. And it's the only such star that we've been able to observe that's of the star's uh, formation date and age that has such extremely low amounts of lithium and refractory elements. And until recently, this was a big mystery. Why is it that the sun have so few refractory elements and so little lithium and all other stars we look at that are the same type and age of our star, the sun, uh, don't? And this, this too will be in, uh, designed to the core, and I've actually got an article that you can read for free at reasons.org in my series of articles called Today's New Reason to Believe. But the breakthrough was when they began to discover rocky planets outside of our solar system. And they discovered an anomaly that when we look at rocky planets in exoplanetary systems, uh, you get what are called the hot Rockies and the warm Rockies and no cool Rockies. And you say, what's the distinction? Okay, hot rocky planets are rocky planets that orbit their host stars very close uh, to the star. Uh, in fact, they orbit the star uh, much closer uh, than, uh, say, uh, one-tenth the distance that the Earth is from the sun. So that, you know, anything that's orbiting its host star within one-tenth of the distance of uh, Earth is from the sun uh, would be called a hot, rocky planet. And you can see that accounts for over 80% of the rocky planets that have been discovered outside the solar system. So what are the warm ones? The warm ones are those that orbit uh, their host stars uh, between one-tenth of the Earth's orbit and Mercury's orbit. Mercury orbits at about 38% uh, the distance of uh, the Sun or the Earth orbiting uh, the Sun. And so, and we call cool Rockies all planets that are orbiting their host stars at the distance of Mercury and beyond. And in the case of our solar system, that makes up 100% of the rocky planets, including the one that no longer exists. Our solar system, uh, when it was first forming, had five rocky planets. You had uh, Mercury, you had Venus, you had Theia, and you had the Earth. Theia and the Earth were orbiting about the same distance from the Sun, and they merged together to make a bigger planet, the current planet Earth, uh, just a few tens of millions of years after the formation of the solar system. But it was this discovery that led astronomers to figure out, now we know why the sun uh, is so exceptionally deficient in lithium and refractory elements. In order to get that deficiency, it's necessary for the host star to transfer its refractory elements to its rocky planets. 
but they also, in order for that to work, you also have to transfer a lot of angular momentum, which explains why our rocky planets are orbiting so distantly from the sun. The sun basically transferred a lot of angular momentum, which pushed them far out, and transferred a lot of these refractory elements, and that explains why the sun has this uh, unique composition, uh, but we don't see any other planetary system uh, where the rocky planets are orbiting so far. And because of that transfer of refractory elements, what's extraordinary is that the rocky planets in the solar system are big and dense, something we don't see in other planetary systems. And the rule of thumb for rocky planet formation is the farther away the rocky planet uh, is uh, from uh, the star, the less dense it will be. Uh, because if it's forming far away, it'll be able to collect matter to it where the heat of the sun will not drive off uh, the light material. And so you would expect the planets orbiting closer to their host stars will be dense because the heat of the star has basically blasted away all the light stuff. And you actually, and that's what's so extraordinary about our solar system, its rocky planets are actually significantly denser than exoplanetary systems where the planets are orbiting close to their stars. And so, again, how do you explain that? Well, it's because the sun transferred all those refractory elements. And you actually see that in our solar system. You've got Mercury at a very high density, then Venus is less dense and Mars is less dense, the anomaly is planet Earth. Earth is actually denser than Mercury. It should be significantly less dense than Venus, but it's actually the densest of the planets in our solar system. And the reason why it's so dense is that two planets merged to form one. And it was that collision event that drove off the light elements and caused Earth to have all these heavy uh, rocky uh, elements. Now, what's been brand new in the scientific literature is that this transfer of refractory elements and angular momentum uh, to the cool Rockies. And incidentally, without cool Rockies, you can't have advanced life. And so that's one reason why I make the comment. Everywhere we look at our Milky Way galaxy, uh, we see conditions that are hostile for advanced life. The only planetary system we've detected where the rocky planets are dense enough and cool enough to make advanced life possible is our solar system. Uh, we don't see any other planetary system. But what's brand new is the recognition that this transfer of angular momentum and these refractory elements did something to the luminosity variability of the sun. And so this next graph here shows you uh, the luminosity variability of the sun that's at the top. What you see at the bottom is the second most stable star we've been able to find in our Milky Way galaxy. Basically showing you that our star, the sun, has five times the luminosity stability of the star that ranks second. And it takes this extraordinary luminosity stability to enable us to live on a planet at this time where we got the climate stability that humans can launch and sustain global high technology civilization with billions of planets or billions of humans on the face of the earth. And my colleagues in astronomy have been searching for 65 years to try to find another star sufficiently like the sun that it could host a planet on which advanced life is possible. They found many stars that are twins of one another, but they've yet to find an adequate twin of the sun. And as you can see here, the best they found elsewhere in our Milky Way galaxy is a star that's got five times the luminosity uh, instability uh, that we see in our star, the sun. And so, again, when November comes and you celebrate Thanksgiving, I would encourage you, thank God for the fact that we live in the one and only super galaxy cluster the Lanakaya Super Galaxy Cluster, in which it's possible to enjoy a Thanksgiving dinner. And we live in the only uh, cluster of galaxies, a Virgo cluster that's possible. We live in the only grouping of galaxies where that's possible. 
the local group. We live in the only galaxy where it's possible. Last week I showed you 12 galaxies that come the closest to matching our Milky Way galaxy, and none of those 12 have the characteristics that allow advanced life to exist. Microbes maybe, but not advanced life. So Star Wars has got it wrong. There is no galaxy far, far away. We live in the one and only galaxy. We live in the one and only uh, bubble within our galaxy where advanced life is possible, the one and only uh, fluff where it's possible, and we're orbiting the only star where it's possible, and we're also in a planetary system where we have the rocky planets that are just right. And I won't go into this. This again is in our book, uh, Design to the Core, <coughs> where we make the point that literally every planet in our solar system must have precisely the characteristics that it does to make advanced life possible here on planet Earth. So again, we wouldn't be here in this classroom as it wasn't for Mars being precisely the way it is, Venus precisely the way it is, Mercury, and all the rest of the planets in our solar system. And we can even extend that to the five asteroid and comet belts the five asteroid and comet belts that orbit about our star of the sun are unlike those of any other planetary system. For about 80% of stars that have planets, as we observe them, we see they have no asteroid and comet belts at all. For the other 20%, they do have asteroid and comet belts, but they're a thousand times bigger than the ones in our Milky Way galaxy, or in our solar system. We live in the only planetary system where the asteroid and comet belts are of just the right distance uh, from uh, the host planet and uh, just the right uh, composition and distribution of asteroids and the comets to make advanced life possible. You say, well, wouldn't life be a whole lot better if we didn't have any asteroids or comets hitting us at all? Well, about half the nickel that's in circulation comes from an asteroid that's struck on the north shore of Lake Superior. 80% of the gold uh, comes from an asteroid that struck in South Africa and 90% of the platinum. Here's the bottom line. The heavens are the work of your hands. They're the work of your hands. Everything we see in the universe tells us it's been designed for our existence. And the Bible is rather open on whether or not God has created life elsewhere and of what kinds, but everywhere we astronomers investigate the book of nature, we see conditions ubiquitously hostile for advanced life except for planet Earth. In fact, I'll leave you with a quote from Neil deGrasse Tyson, an atheist astrophysicist. He says, the universe is out to kill us. Everywhere we go in the universe, deadly conditions for advanced life except for the one galaxy, the one star, the one planet, the one moon uh, that makes possible advanced life. So increasingly, astronomical observations reveal that we indeed are alone in the vastness of this universe of two trillion galaxies. And uh, scripture's got something to say about it, namely that life exists because God created it, not natural forces. You can read this book coming out next month, Designed to the Core, and you'll also find material an improbable planet. As I mentioned, you can find material in the Crater in the Cosmos, fourth edition, and anyone can get a free chapter at reasons.org slash Ross. And all this is uh, archived at paradoxes.org. Uh, it's archived on uh, YouTube. You can download past recordings. So if you miss one of these talks, you can download all four there. And we're actually gonna be at Reasons to Believe editing the four talks that I've been giving uh, so that all the repetition will be taken out. Uh, there won't be any review, and you'll be able to see it as a single item. With this, I'm gonna stop and take questions. And the rule of thumb is I take questions on any subject. It doesn't have to be uh, just on the subject matter here. I'll take questions from the live audience. I'll also be taking questions from people that are joining us uh, through YouTube uh, live. <coughs> Well, let me begin. Any questions here from the, the in-person audience? Yes. Can you, you hear me without a mic? No. Okay, yeah, we're going to give you a microphone. So wait for the microphone to get to you.
of all the different categories of ways that the universe is fine-tuned, how many different fine-tuning features are there now that you're up to? Yeah, good question. How many features of the universe, and I think you mean the universe, our galaxy cluster, our galaxy, our star, our sun, I'll stop a planet Earth and the moon. We won't go into the details of the interior of the Earth. You can go to reasons.org slash fine tuning, and that will pop up for you for free, a 300-page compendium uh, where we list the factors that were in the published peer-reviewed literature as of 2007. So we are in need of updating that compendium. But even if you just look at that compendium, the answer to your question is 824 different known parameters must be fine-tuned. The list today is well over 1,200. So yeah, we have a significant project here of updating uh, that compendium. But even with just the 824, you can calculate that without God supernaturally intervening, the probability that we would find another body anywhere with the entirety of the universe that would have the capability of sustaining advanced life, or not even talking civilization, just the possibility that creatures the equivalent of us human beings uh, could exist, the probability is less than one chance in 10 to the 1,050th power. <clears throat> now, if you were asked me, oh, what, where does it stand in 2022? Very conservatively, the probability be less than one chance in 10 to the 1500. So we're talking 1500 zeros after the one. Incidentally, that online compendium at reasons.org slash fine tuning, we actually give you all the peer reviewed scientific papers that document the fine tuning that we talk about there. And we actually show you how we mathematically calculate the fine tuning. Uh, so you can review that. But yeah, we do need to update it. But even if it's just one chance in 10, the 1,050th, that's roughly equivalent uh, to you being able to win the California lottery 130 consecutive times where you buy just one ticket each time. Okay, that's how tiny that probability is. Or as a math professor friend of mine put it, it's no different than the probability of winning the California lottery 130 consecutive times where you don't buy any tickets at all. <laughs> so, uh, or to put that in context, I mean, the probability that you'd be able to pick a especially marked proton amongst all the protons in the universe, that's one chance in 10 to the 79. So we're looking at a probability that's absurdly more remote uh, than that probability. Which is why, as I began this whole series, if there's life elsewhere in the universe, the only way it could be there is if God created it. Natural process cannot explain how life elsewhere in the universe, even at a microbial level, let alone at an advanced level. But just the possibility of finding a body where life could be created is that tiny, which is why I'm fairly confident. I think God made us and us alone in the universe as beings that are constrained by the physics of the universe. Okay, we got an online question. Here. Online question. From last week, in fact. Uh, someone without a name, just a number. Are there ways to distinguish between seeing evil spirits and psychosis? Okay, good question. Uh, something we do address in our book, Lights in the Sky and Little Green Men, and something I've had a lot of personal experience with. Uh, how do you distinguish between someone who's being possessed by a demon or oppressed by a demon and someone who's having uh, psychological uh, breakdowns. And you know, it's possible. We humans sometimes undergo uh, deficiencies in our brain. Incidentally, uh, it can happen anytime you go without sleep for a long period. You will hallucinate and you'll be thinking things are real uh, that are not real. Something I've personally experienced myself because when I was in my youth, I spent uh, seven days on a radio telescope. And the problem with radio telescopes is uh, you can observe 24 hours a day. Now, I was sleeping, but I was uh, taking 11 second naps every half minute. And that's not really not enough to uh, really get your brain to recover. 
After those seven days, I was taking a train back to the university, and uh, you know, a conductor came by and said, are you all right, sir? Because what I was doing, I was writing with a felt tip pen on the window of the train. And I said, yeah, I'm fine. Just give me the parallactic angle, please. Because I was hallucinating that I was still on the radio telescope. It was interesting. The conductor basically vacated the whole car except for me. So I had the whole car to myself for the rest of the trip. But as tired as I was, I wasn't able to go to sleep. I was just hallucinating. So that can happen. So how do you distinguish? Well, I ran into quite a few uh, occurrences when I was in the Soviet Union when the communists were still in control and addressing audiences of scientists, when a number of those scientists were involved in occult physics research, and therefore several of them were demon-possessed. And uh, what I've noticed is only people that are demon-possessed uh, will come out with vile cursing uh, and accusations towards Jesus Christ as Jesus Christ being a morally vile person. So they'd be accusing Jesus uh, repeatedly of all this horrendously uh, immoral behavior. You know, I run into people who take the Lord's name in vain, but they stop short. Uh, they do not accuse Jesus of uh, that kind of gross immorality. And that kind of tells you that something's going on because any rational human being would recognize Jesus of Nazareth was not an immoral individual uh, and certainly not at that level of immorality. Uh, and uh, the other thing I noticed too is that when I would, I would had a, there was a Christian with me and I said, look, uh, these demon-possessed people were basically interrupting me. I couldn't give my lectures because they would just scream and yell and they would be cursing me just like they were cursing Jesus. So and again, that's a symptom. Normal people do not curse out someone they've never met before. Uh, Demon-possessed people will do that. The other thing I've observed is demon-possessed people, when they meet a Christian that they view as a threat, uh, they will often react in terror. So I've seen situations where the demon-possessed person curls up into the fetal position, trying to get as far away from me as possible, and utterly quivering in uh, fear. And so normal people don't do that. Uh, that's something, uh, whereas people that are having, and, you know, for example, people who are suffering from a brain injury or dementia, they'll be seeing things, like they'll be seeing people that aren't there, uh, but they're not behaving like demon-possessed people. There's a difference. And the big difference is, uh, for example, I was addressing an audience of physicists and philosophers where about a quarter of them were demon-possessed, I had a Christian praying at the back that the demons would be quiet, and they're all dead quiet. And all the people in the room that were not demon-possessed said, we've never seen this before. These people are always interrupting and yelling and screaming and they're misbehaving, and this time everything's quiet. So in other words, the demons do react to the authority of Christ in their life, uh, whereas you don't see that with people that are just having these kinds of... Uh, you know, uh, paranoia type uh, visions that are not real. Yes, go ahead. You're going to need to hold the microphone close to your mouth. Okay. Is there a short answer to why evolution does not work? A short answer as to why evolution does not work. Okay, we've got long answers in our books. I, I I'm going to give you a short answer as to why evolution doesn't work. Well, when I meet evolutionary biologists that are convinced that uh, we don't need a God to explain the origin and history of life, I begin by saying, well, what about the origin of life? And frequently they will say, we're going to pass on that one because they recognize there's not even a naturalistic scenario for the origin of life, let alone a model. Uh, and they really want to talk about the history of life. Uh, but I'll give you a quote from a book written by a couple of paleontologists, uh, Irwin and um, uh, James Valentine. Uh, neither one of them are, are theists, but they make the point when we look at the Cambrian explosion, what we see is at the very beginning of the Cambrian period, the diversification of phyla 
A phylum refers to an animal category where we have a basic body plan. So, I mean, if you look at the classification system, species, genera, and then you go to uh, families, orders, classes, and then phyla is the most general uh, category. At the base of the Cambrian explosion, the diversification of phyla occurs first before the diversification of classes, before the diversification of orders. Last of all, you get the diversification of species. Naturalistic evolution posits that natural selection, mutations, gene exchange, and epigenetics will produce small changes that over time become big changes. And so from a naturalistic perspective, the prediction is you get the diversification of species first, followed by the diversification of genera, followed by the diversification of families. And the farther up you go in the classification system, the longer it takes for the diversification to appear. And last of all, you get the diversification of phyla. But of both the Avalon explosion and the Cameron explosion, it goes the opposite way. The phyla diversify first, and moreover, the phyla show up simultaneously. It's not like you get one first, then you get a later one. And the most advanced of the phyla, the phylum we all belong to, the chordate phylum, it shows up at the very beginning of the Cambrian explosion. So the most complex of the phylum is there immediately at the beginning of the Cambrian explosion, again, the opposite of what naturalism would uh, predict. So that's the short answer. Okay. I've got a, uh, another online question for you. Uh, what is the role of the Holy Spirit in our lives, and how do we interact with him? Okay, good question. <clears throat> you know, if you were to go back decades ago, uh, I was very involved in training people in our church uh, just to go cold turkey door to door, talk to people, and answer their spiritual questions uh, with the possibility of leading them to faith in Christ. And so we wound up having these Bible studies in different neighborhoods filled with adults that were brand new converts to Christianity. My practice was to first expose them to 1 John. Uh, the first letter that John wrote is towards the end of the Bible, and I believe to this day it's the best book uh, to show brand new Christians. Why? Because 1 John chapter 1 begins by saying, God is light. And if you read the first chapter of the Gospel of John, it says, God's light has gone out into all the world refers to the Son, Jesus Christ, as the light of the world. But it says every human has received light from God and that we will be judged according to what we've done with that light. If we receive uh, that light, we proceed towards salvation. If we reject that light, we proceed towards condemnation. But uh, the Gospel of John doesn't really define what God's light is. First John does. So it begins by saying, God is one and God is light. You go to chapter two and it says the sun is life. And it's the sun that bestows life upon us human beings. You go to chapter three of 1 John and it says the father bestows love upon human beings. Chapter four addresses the Holy Spirit. And it says the Holy Spirit bestows truth. And so what is the light of God? It's not electromagnetic radiation. The light of God is a combination of God's life, God's love, and God's truth. And the three members of the triune God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, they divide their labors. So it's one God in three persons, and each person relates to us in a way that's distinct from the other two persons. And so I would always try to show this to brand new Christians and say, this is how you relate to God. Because a lot of new Christians, they're mystified by the triune God. I say, hey, we can't understand everything about the Trinity, but it's one essence. And they say, what does that mean? It means that all three persons of the Godhead have the same mind, the same purpose, the same plan. They don't contradict one another. They've got the same character attributes. 
but because it's three persons, they can relate to one another. And so the way they relate to one another is the way God wants us to relate to one another. So all of us who are Christians, we're to relate to one another as the three persons of the triune God relate to one another and recognize that it's through the Holy Spirit we gain increasing truth. It's through the Father that we experience increasing degrees of love and it's through the Son that we experience increasing degrees of light. And so as we continue to relate to the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we increasingly experience and gain the capacity to express more life, love, and truth to people all around us and to God himself. Hallelujah. Hallelujah indeed. Wow. Yeah. Okay, Norm has a question. Yes, Norm. Hi. Uh, going back to what you were uh, what you des you're describing initially, and about the uh, uh, variation of, of, of the variation of the light being emitted at the edge of the black hole, and you made the point that uh, that 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 intensity of that light coming out from that edge was sufficient to uh, uh, to limit uh, the types of life that uh, that could be that could exist within the galaxy, and I think you said that 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 that, that the light that was that we'd observed was such that that. The, uh, that eliminated the possibility of advanced life existing, and so, so that becomes that becomes a direct argument then to, I mean, if it's if it is accepted by the astronomical community, that becomes an argument about uh, the, to answer the question: uh, Does does life of advanced of an advanced type does it exist elsewhere? And so my my question is: uh, Do you see that limitation? being accepted generally by the astronomical community and therefore, and if, it's, if it is accepted by them, does that become something that, that can be accepted by society as, as saying that there are, is no advanced life out there? Yeah, very good question, Norm. And uh, only a year ago did astronomers recognize that there's nothing very massive around the supermassive black hole of our Milky Way galaxy. And uh, they did see radiation and variations in the radiation. And the variations, even a year ago, were noted to be so small. They said, well, it's probably consuming comets and asteroids, but nothing bigger. These 10 papers basically affirm that, that that is a correct conclusion. It's not consuming anything big. But if it was consuming stuff big, it would limit advanced light. And so the question is, for advanced light to be possible, is one of the requirements that that life exists in a spiral galaxy that is a supermassive black hole that's as small as a supermassive black hole in terms of its mass as the one in the center of a Milky Way galaxy that is as quiet as ours is? And the answer is yes. And do we see any other galaxy that we know of that has those required features? The answer is no. Our Milky Way galaxy is the only one where the galaxy is of sufficient size with a just right spiral structure with a supermassive black hole that comes in at only four million times the mass of our star of the sun, or presently it's extremely quiet and only absorbing tiny pieces of matter. Now, in the scientific literature, this is referred to as the rare earth doctrine. The idea that our galaxy, our star, our planet, our moon is rare in possessing the characteristics that would permit the existence of physical advanced light. What you also see in the scientific literature, however, is they express certain optimism about finding bodies elsewhere in the universe where microbes could consistently exist. The rare earth doctrine as, and again, I'm quoting people that are not believers. These are people that are not theists. They do say, uh, that there is increasing and compelling evidence for the rare earth doctrine, uh, that advanced life has to be extremely rare and perhaps even unique here on planet Earth, but maybe there's a better chance for microbial life, which is why I began this four-part series basically making the point uh, the door isn't wide even for microbial life. Uh, trying to get a microbe from physics and chemistry uh, isn't easy. To quote Louis Pasteur, you're not going to get life from non-life. 
And uh, so that's why I put that in my uh, second lecture, uh, why even with microbes. But that's not accepted in the scientific literature. What we do see a growing acceptance is if we're talking advanced life, we indeed may be it in the entirety of the universe. Uh, another, another online question? I, I think uh, we did have another an online question. Okay. Yeah, go for the online question first. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Uh, this one, uh, super from a person designated supernova. Nearby galaxy NGC 7727 hosts two supermassive black holes separated, separated by only 1,600 light years. What will happen when these two black holes collide? Well, okay, I know you all heard that. He's talking about a galaxy that's got two supermassive black holes that are separated just by 1,600 light years. That's fairly common amongst galaxies in the universe uh, because what we see in the universe is that on a fairly frequent basis, two galaxies will merge together to make a single galaxy, and each of those galaxies will have a supermassive black hole, and so you will have occasions where the two supermassive black holes as the galaxies merge together the two supermassive black holes will merge and become an even bigger supermassive black hole. And typically when they do merge, you have a lot of matter being drawn into them. So that's uh, what they call an active stage in a galaxy, uh, where two supermassive black holes in the process of merging, and they're drawing in a lot of matter as they merge, and they're extremely bright and radiating intense, deadly uh, radiation. And there's even cases where three of them are merging together. And by the way, that will happen with our galaxy because the Andromeda galaxy is on a collision course with our Milky Way galaxy. And so its supermassive black hole inevitably is going to merge with our supermassive black hole and make a bigger supermassive black hole. Uh, but I wouldn't worry about that anytime soon. That merger event of the supermassive black hole in the Andromeda galaxy with a supermassive black hole in our galaxy, it'll happen in about five billion years from now. So uh, you can put that off in terms of your investment strategies for at least a short period of time. So in Genesis 6, verse 3, it says, the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever, for he is indeed flesh, yet his days shall be 120 years. Um, since you were talking about black holes, is there any um, leftover radiation from 12, 13, 14,000 years ago that uh, we could measure that uh, supports, or at least what we see at this time? Yes, good question, and I do address that in my book, Navigating Genesis. I think it's chapter 13 in that book where I address the question, how did the human lifespan drop from eight or 900 years down to a maximum of about 120 years? And I make the point that for that to be possible, humans living before Genesis 6-3, that is before Noah's flood, would have needed to be exposed to a lot less cosmic radiation than we are today. And so what I put in Navigating Genesis is evidence being produced by two astronomers, uh, Wolfendale in Britain and Ehrlichan in Russia. They've been partners in research for the last 30, 35 years. And basically they've been making the point that when we look at the cosmic ray spectrum, we see what they call as a knee which basically indicates that there was a supernova in recent history of the Earth that today is responsible for about 95% of what we call killer cosmic rays. Killer cosmic rays, most cosmic rays are made up of electrons and protons, which really aren't a problem in limiting our lifespan. The ones that are a problem are cosmic rays where the nuclei is bigger than the nuclei of a helium atom. So you know, carbon, oxygen, uh, even uranium. Uh, we do see cosmic rays where the nuclei are like uranium. And if they're moving slowly, not a problem. 
It's the fast-moving, heavy nuclei cosmic rays that are the most deadly for shortening a human lifespan. But these two astronomers have now identified the supernova remnant that's responsible for 95% of the killer cosmic rays, and they've documented that the supernova must have exploded close to the Earth. They know it's close because the supernova remnant is about 15 degrees across in the sky. So it means it had to be relatively close, and they're trying to come up with a date on it. All they can tell so far, they've been working on this for three decades, is it exploded sometime less than 100,000 years ago. And so a scenario I suggest in navigating Genesis is that before Noah's flood, uh, this cosmic ray bath wasn't there because the supernova hadn't exploded yet. Uh, at the time of Noah's flood, it explodes and you get a shortening of human lifespans. If you look at Genesis chapter 11, you see an exponential decline in the lifespan of human beings uh, from 900 years uh, down to, no, I think lived to be 950, and, but when you get down to Abraham, uh, we're now getting close to the 120 limit. And that exponential decline is something you'd expect uh, from a nearby intense supernova eruption. What Ehrlichman and Wolfendale have been able to document is that that radiation comes from a single nearby supernova eruption. However, in answer to your question, that's only one of three factors that need to be taken into account to explain the shortening of human lifespans. But from a theological perspective, we're way better off living only a maximum of 120 years than living a maximum of 969 years. If you allow people to live as long as eight or 900 years, that tilts the advantage towards evil people that are intent on taking advantage of righteous people. That was the problem of the pre-flood era, is that the population was being thinned out where all the righteous people were being killed off by the wicked people. And if you allow a serial killer, for example, to live 900 years, that serial killer can do a lot of damage. But if that serial killer can only live eight or 90 years, it limits the damage. And so it's a theological point that's being made is that we're really better off having a short lifespan than a long lifespan because 80 or 90 years is plenty of time for a righteous person to establish their virtue before their creator. And allowing people to live longer simply tilts the advantage uh, towards the wicked. I mean, thank God Adolf Hitler only lived 56 years. We have one last question before we end. Okay. Uh, yeah, I was uh, curious uh, as far as the supermassive black hole at the center of our galaxy going from uh, that it used to be in an active state. I was curious if uh, that's been correlated to any of like the mass extinction events that we see. You know, I I is that related in any way to those? Yeah, good question. Is it possible that uh, past active episodes of our supermassive black hole in the center of our galaxy may explain some of the mass extinction events? The answer is maybe. Uh, we don't know enough yet to be able to say for sure. And, uh, you know, one of the things I could see in these research papers I read is that the supermassive black hole is so quiet it's very difficult to tell what's going on. The measurements are extremely challenging to make. And they're basically saying, we're probably gonna need another 20 years of observations before we can come up with any really significantly uh, more definitive conclusions than what we've been able to draw so far. Very different from the supermassive black hole in M87. I mean, that supermassive black hole is six and a half billion times the mass of our star of the sun. It's pulling in huge amounts of matter. Uh, and even though it's 53 million light years away, if its jet was pointed towards us, we'd be toast. Fortunately, it's pointed away from us. And yet when it's pulling in copious amounts of matter, you get these powerful uh, you know, relativistic jets of deadly radiation coming out. Nothing like that is happening in our Milky Way galaxy. Uh, but that image I showed you back here that one tells us it was happening in the past. There were jets coming out in the past 
but right now we can't measure it yet. So thank you, one and all. And next week I'll be starting a new series as basically the origin of the elements of, for life. Where do they come from? What has the Bible got to say about it? And what has the book of nature got to say about it? So I'll see all of you next week. Thank you. You're welcome to partake of the treats that are over there. <laughs> <laughs>